Well, we've been to Louisiana for a little voodoo vacation, and we've been inside the Oval Office in the White House. Well, sort of. Kinda. <laughs> and we even learned to eat fire like a carny out on Coney Island. We're here for our final travel destination, and that is Las Vegas, entertainment capital of the world. But we're not here to gamble. We're not even here to see the famous shows. No, we're here to see a couple hundred people talking with puppets. You'd have to be a dummy not to enjoy this. Since the first casino opened on the Strip in 1941, Las Vegas has become a paradise for big spenders and a mecca for show business headliners. Hey! When we were researching the city, looking for something out of the ordinary, we discovered that Vegas hosts the annual Ventriloquist Festival, a gathering of eccentric characters and their sidekicks. Hey, it's stuffy in there. We're meeting up with the festival organizer. I'm Valentine Box, and I'm a ventriloquist. Dum dum de dum, dum dum de dum. Valentine Box. Hey, it's hey, Box. Hey, Box. That's right. We're here for the ventriloquist convention. We brought our dummies, and we're ready to learn. Well, come with me. I'll show you where it is. This is Louie, by the way. Hey, hi, guys. <laughs> it's a pretty exciting time. And... We're here to find out just why you don't see ventriloquists around much anymore. Is ventriloquism just too weird for the average American? We have lawyers, we have doctors, we have school teachers, and we have people that want to be professional entertainers. We'd like to know how the art of ventriloquism really got started. I mean, is it an old art? How, how far back does it go? Well, as a practice, it, it goes back thousands of years. Thousands? It's, yeah, it started as a form of necromantic divining. Wait a second, say it, that again? Necromantic diviner? What's that? Well, that's divining the future by communication with the dead. And there was a certain kind of necromancer that practiced what we call gastromancy, divining by the stomach. And what he or she would do, they would talk to their stomach, uh, and the spirit was heard to answer them. Hello? Uh, hello. Can you hear me? And then they would predict the future. Hence, they were called ventriloquists, from the two Latin words ventra loqua, belly to speak. This ability to throw their voices terrifies highly superstitious people during the Middle Ages. Even intellectuals, who you'd think would know better, were spooked by them. Photius, the patriarch of Constantinople, said it is a wickedness lurking in the human belly. So these people were really a little too good for their own good then. <laughs> that's right, that's right. But when Fred Russell introduces the first lap figure in 1896, ventriloquism as we know it is born. So, Valentine, we're interested in becoming master ventriloquists. <laughs> you are. Well, the first thing is, is creating a voice for your character. Now, I I'll show you what the difference is with a ventriloquial voice and a voice. I'm speaking like this, one, two, three, four, and here's my character's voice. And uh, one, two, three, four. So just try that. You can move your lips. You can... Okay, just a higher voice than, no, than my no, own. No, it's a nasal voice. It goes mainly through the nose. One, two, three, four. Good. One, two, three, four. Okay, and so now we've got the voice straight. Now the most important part is lip control. Now let's just try the alphabet, okay? Teeth and lips slightly apart. Mm -hmm. You ready? Here we go. A, B, C, D, M, M, R, S, T, U, X, Y, Z. Right. Ah, okay. Oh, by the way, I wanted to point out one thing to you, Mark. Yeah. Uh, years ago, uh, ventriloquists who weren't very good at lip control used to grow large beards to cover up their lips. Hmm. So you're on your way. Yeah, I'm, on the right, <laughs> I'm on the right track. <laughs> yeah, right. Gosh, I'm glad to see you back again. It's out of my mouth. I see it all now. Just Charlie McCarthy is undoubtedly the most illustrious figure ever to grace a ventriloquist's knee. In 1936, his creator, Edgar Bergen, takes ventriloquism from vaudeville into the nightclubs. In that same year, they hit the radio waves and become an overnight sensation. So was Edgar Bergen ever as popular as Charlie McCarthy? No. We know who the star of that act is. Exactly, exactly. I mean, he, Charlie McCarthy became a real person. Lunch at the White House. Hot luck with the Roosevelt's. Yes. <laughs> 
When Edgar Bergman was presented to Eleanor Roosevelt, she actually automatically extended a hand to Charlie, expecting <laughs> him to shake it. Do you think he ever resented the, the fact that the, uh, his, his creation became more popular than him? No, he was a clever, clever man, a clever showman, uh, Edgar Bergman. He even had a room for Charlie McCarthy in his house. When people used to come over, he used to take him to the room. And there was a, there was a note on the desk there, and it was half scribbled by Charlie. And he said, oh, yeah, Charlie wrote that note. Is my head okay? Yeah, yeah. Did he move his lips while he was doing a radio performance? Yes, he did. And, and, and the reason why is because on radio, you have to articulate, and the voice becomes different when you do that. And so Bergen remained moving his lips. Right. And that's, that's what happened. Oh, even when he went into TV? I mean, he yeah, when he went into film. Today, performers are expected to do what Edgar Bergen always struggled to perfect speak, sing, and show off without moving his lips. And Ron Lucas, who has mastered the art, has the longest running ventriloquist gig in a major Vegas showroom. This weird Vegas isn't over yet. I don't know what you're gonna make me say, dude. Okay. You're about to see Moran make a real dummy of himself. On the History Channel! <laughs> We're in Las Vegas for the ninth annual Ventriloquist Festival, the last leg of our pursuit of weird vacations. As always, it means taking a detour from the straight and narrow. We start out on the strip, the chapels, the slots, and blackjack to get a sense of what Vegas is all about. But with our dummies in tow, we feel far more at home at the Ventriloquist Convention. Hello. <laughs> You were saying that some ventriloquists could be considered a little, um, how should I put this, uh, nuts? Yeah. <laughs> well, we do get the stereotype. We really do. Yeah. All the wedding party were ventriloquists. <laughs> we're not crazy. Some of us may seem crazy, but no, I don't talk to them whenever I'm by myself. Most men truck say they're kind of schizophrenic. Most of these guys, if you talk to them, <laughs> they're a little weird, you know? And, and if you look at their dummies and their, and their eyeballs are kind of weird, their schizo comedians are twisted enough, but ventriloquists. Action! And Hollywood hasn't helped their reputation. Ventriloquists are often portrayed as deranged schizophrenic entertainers. As in the great Gabbo the classic horror movie Dead of Night and Magic starring Anthony Hopkins in 1978. It is a strange profession. Oh, I can't wait. We're going to see the Ron Lucas show. <laughs> Please welcome Ron Lucas. Just tell me your name. Hi, I'm Nina Scorch. I'm green. When Vegas ventriloquist Ron Lucas is seven years old, he watches Edgar Bergen imitate a baby crying and gets hooked on the art. Before age 20, he practices for more than 13,000 hours. Today, he's surpassed Bergen's ability to throw his voice, and he's set new standards when it comes to the figures he uses. Friends of mine do movie special effects, and they help me build Scorch here. Uh, and he's, uh, he's, he's a pretty high-tech character here. He's, he's, he's made of latex and fiberglass, and he's got a lot of remote control features. If you just clap your hands, <laughs> you got to clap a little louder, I guess. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> this is a remote control device used for flying model airplanes, which means it's got a two-mile radius. We're going to get Scorch off of his little cattle prod here. Uh, we'll just lift that out. <clears throat> this was an expensive little toy here that sort of got out of hand. So, so now, now the biggest thing you have to do as a puppet is make him blink. So that would be okay, the... That that's, that's right there, yeah. Hi. Hey, what's going on? Oh, we're, we're doing a show. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he, he's controlling your face. Want it? <laughs> he's... Who is he? That's Mark. Mark, hi. This is Mark, too. Hi. Whoa! The ugly clone. Hey, no, no. <laughs> I think I resent that. Ron has come a long way from the first ventriloquists who began to use hand puppets in the 18th century. When the first wooden figure is introduced in the late 19th century, its eyes and mouth are manipulated by pulling hooks inside the figure's head. I think what we're trying to do is, is find a way to make uh, ventriloquism contemporary. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is my tiny contribution to that, you know, by using a little more remote control figures. While most ventriloquists dream of having their own show like Ron, there are some who have found a different calling. Ventriloquism has become a popular avenue for evangelical groups who use the figures to educate and entertain their followers. 
Ryan Baumgardner, the youngest gospel ventriloquist we could track down, started preaching when he was just 12 years old. Today, at age 21, he gets about 100 church gigs a year. I was allowed to pray to God anymore. Oh dear, I guess Daniel stopped praying, huh? For him, this is the perfect balance of using his God-given gifts as a performer and as an evangelist. Look at the hands go up. When Ron asked for a volunteer, I wondered if I could keep up with him on stage. Even though I'd only had one lesson, I was ready for the challenge. Have you enjoyed your convention so far? I've found that ventriloquists are an extremely weird lot. And, and, and from our point of view, that's a compliment, folks. OK, head up, hands in front, preferably. When I pinch the back of your neck, that's your cue to drop your jaw really big. Let's do it two times the sound. OK. That was good. Do it, do it four times. Okie dokie. How about once, really big? <laughs> hang on a second. I think I have some dummy clothes in the trunk. Okay, hang on just a second. I had no idea I was going to be Ron's dummy. It was made for a human head, Mark, and I apologize. This is the moment of truth. I have the controls. What do you think? I like this. Say it again. I like this a lot, Ron. Why the heck didn't you do this sooner? When watching Ron perform, it's easy to forget that he's doing all the talking. I don't know what you're going to make me say, dude. Do you dance, yes or no? What the hell, yeah. It's weird not knowing what you're going to say next. I used to work at Chippendales. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> the Vegas fans showed us that ventriloquism is thriving in amateur and professional circles. Oh, yeah. And any dummy can learn to speak with their mouth closed.